The Revenant is based on a true story of a man named Hugh Glass, portrayed by Leonardo DiCaprio in the movie. But the true story of Hugh Glass is even more insane and badass than what's shown in The Revenant. Hugh Glass was born somewhere near Scranton, Pennsylvania in 1783 to Scotch-Irish immigrant parents. In his early years, Hugh was a man of the sea. Until, of course, his ship was boarded by the infamous French pirate Jean Lafitte. Hugh was given a choice to die or become a pirate. Glass chose to become a pirate over being killed, and he lived the next few years of his life being forced to go out on murderous pirating raids and do all the things that pirates do. Finally, after about two years of that, Hugh escaped his pirate captors, jumping off a ship and swimming ashore in Texas. Of course, when Hugh swam ashore, he wasn't exactly safe. The Karankawa Indians patrolled those shores, and they didn't take too kindly to pirates. At the time, it was rumored the Karankawa were cannibals, and they'd love nothing more than to capture, kill, and eat a European pirate. So, Glass had to make his way through their territory without a map or anything, which he did, making his way to Kansas. Glass was traveling with one other man who escaped the pirate fleet. Though they thought they were out of the woods once they got to Kansas, they weren't. They were both promptly captured by a band of Pawnee Indians. The Pawnee then hung Glass's traveling companion upside down and rammed pine needles into his skin all over his body and then lit him on fire. Glass was forced to watch and he was next in line. However, just as the Pawnee were about to stick his body full of pine needles and light him on fire, Hugh Glass offered the Pawnee a large packet of vermilion, a bright red powdered dye that could be used for war paint and other purposes. It worked. The Pawnee loved it and ended up inviting Glass to live with them. And he did. He lived with the Pawnee for about two years, even taking a wife, before continuing on his life's journey, making his way to St. Louis. That's where Hugh Glass first got into the fur trade and became a mountain man. Basically, his job was living in the mountains, living off the land, trapping beavers, and selling and trading their pelts with fur companies and Indian tribes. Hugh responded to an advertisement in the Missouri Gazette by General William Henry Ashley of the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, which called for a corps of 100 men to, quote, ascend the River Missouri as part of a fur trading venture. During their journey, the Corps of 100 stopped to trade with a band of Ree Indians, but the Ree didn't want to trade, and they killed a huge portion of the mountain men. Not to be outdone, the remaining mountain men set the Ree's village on fire. Many men, women, and children died in what ended up being an all-out war, which Hugh found himself right in the middle of. When all was said and done, Hugh survived, and he and 13 other mountain men started making their way towards Yellowstone to trap beavers. One fateful day on their journey, Hugh walked into a suspiciously cleared area, which ended up being a bear's nest. What happened to Hugh in that bear's nest is basically exactly what happened in The Revenant. He was mauled within an inch of his life. The bear ripped chunks off of his body and threw it to her cubs to eat. Then the cubs joined in, slashing him and tearing at him while their mother held him down. By the time the rest of Hugh's men got to him and were able to kill the bears, he was a mangled mess. He can't see, he can't speak, he can't move. The men did the best they could to bandage him, but the assumption was Hugh would be dead by the morning at best. However, Hugh survived the night. Needing to make headway, General Henry decided to have the men make a makeshift stretcher and carry Hugh the rest of the way. But after some time, trying to carry the 98% dead Hugh on a stretcher over rough terrain through the mountains was starting to not make sense. Still believing Hugh was on death's door, the general decided to leave Hugh behind, leaving two men with him to wait for him to die. Those two men were Fitzgerald, an older man about the same age as Hugh, and Bridger, who was just a teenager. After five days, Hugh was still alive. Now, they weren't alone in the mountains. The mountain men were being pursued this whole time by the Ree Indians, you know, because they burned down their village. Sensing the Ree were close, Fitzgerald made the call to take all of Hugh's provisions, his rifle, his shot, etc., and just leave Hugh to die. Since he was so close to death anyway, Fitzgerald and Bridger dragged Hugh's mangled, unconscious body down to the edge of a creek and left. But Hugh didn't die. After several days, Hugh came to. He drank water from the creek and ate berries from a tree that was luckily within reach. Only one of his arms and one of his legs was cooperating, the rest of his body broken, battered, and torn from the bear attack. After a few days of being conscious, Hugh became incensed that he was left for dead and decided he was going to crawl his way, hundreds and hundreds of miles through the mountains to Yellowstone, to find the men that abandoned him. From his time living with the Pawnee, Hugh had learned to fend for himself in the wilderness. During his trek, he continued to wash and care for his wounds as he could. At one point, he saw a pack of wolves attacking a buffalo. He crawled over and scared the wolves away, and ate some of the raw buffalo carcass himself. Soon after, 
Now a little stronger from the raw buffalo meat, Hugh came upon an abandoned Indian village. Though it was abandoned, there were dogs there, and Hugh managed to strangle one and eat it. Eventually, Hugh was able to walk, his wounds, bones, and ligaments healing. But the one thing that wasn't healing was his back, which at this point was covered in maggots, living and feeding off the open wounds. Hugh came upon a party of Sioux Indians who were friendly and meant him no harm. They took Hugh in and tended to him. They even sewed bear skin onto his back to cover his gaping, infected, maggot-infested wounds, and helped Hugh get to Fort Kiowa, where Hugh stayed for two days meeting up with French fur traders, before demanding to be placed on a boat to be taken up river, still trying to hunt down the men that left him for dead. So far, Hugh had crawled, stumbled, and walked his way 250 miles. This boat upriver would take him another 300 miles in his quest for vengeance. And it did. But when Hugh, along with the French fur traders, made it to their destination, a Mandan Indian village where they would trade beaver pelts, they found the village had been overtaken by the Ree, who then murdered Glass's entire company. Again, Hugh was alone in the woods, being hunted by Indians. Again. Just as the Ree were about to capture Hugh, a heroic group of Mandan Indians swooped in. They rescued Hugh from certain death and delivered him to safety at the Fort Tilton trading post. At Fort Tilton, Hugh could stay and rest and take a breather. But he didn't. He didn't want to rest. All he wanted to do was hunt down Fitzgerald. Six months after he was attacked by a bear and left for dead, six months of crawling through the mountains in frigid temperatures, eating raw buffalo with maggots all over his back, six months of nothing but focus on getting his revenge, Hugh found his old company in a stockade, which was the new Fort Henry along the Bighorn River. But only Bridger was still at the fort. After talking to him, and since Bridger was just a teenager, Hugh came to realize that Bridger was basically an innocent bystander in all of this, and Fitzgerald was the sole person responsible for the last six months of hell. Severe winter weather kept Glass at Fort Henry for a few months, but as soon as he could, he jumped on a boat and headed downriver on an official mission for the fur company to get to Fort Atkinson, which is where Fitzgerald was said to be. On their journey, the group came upon what they thought were Pawnee Indians along the river but they ended up being re-Indians, and Hugh found himself in yet another battle for survival. In the chaos of the fight, some of Hugh's companions escaped on boat and made their way to Fort Atkinson, but Hugh, of course, wasn't so lucky. He was left alone in the wilderness, again, with the re on his tail. After walking another 400 miles through the unforgiving wilderness with nothing but a pocket knife, Hugh made it to Fort Atkinson, and he found Fitzgerald. But there was a problem. Fitzgerald had joined the U.S. Army and was now government property. Hugh Glass wouldn't be allowed to kill a soldier, so he never got his revenge the end. Seriously, that's it. After all of that, that was the end of the line. No dramatic stare down, no knock down drag out fight. Hugh Glass came back from the dead and crawled through a year's worth of hell you can't even begin to imagine just to be told by an army captain, yeah, nah. And that's the real story of Hugh Glass, which is somehow even more insane and badass than how it's shown in The Revenant. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to this channel for more of history's weirdness that you won't find in your textbooks. All those textbooks that you had to give back. No one has their textbooks anymore, right? I don't have mine. Anyway, there's this video here. There's this one here. There's more stuff here. There's more good stuff. If you liked it, stick around.